Hit me yesterday, Kurt, watching as we attempt to crown uh, Tom Brady or Josh Allen or any of these quarterbacks here as the next thing, as the next team to win this year. You know, you know, the Chiefs haven't lost in 366 days, or rather one game in 366 days. Do we almost take them for granted now? I mean, I think to a degree, Andrew, you, you know, we take them for granted because we just know they're going to be there. And the big question becomes, okay, who's going to challenge the Chiefs? And so we're not really talking about them right now uh, because we know that they're up there. They're one of the best teams in the league. And as we just showed, they're arguably the best quarterback in the National Football League right now. And so I don't think it's so much taking them for granted. I, I think we're just looking around going, okay, who else is going to show up? Who else is going to be in the mix when it's all said and done? Because we know the Chiefs are going to be there. And you know, I think at times, too, when you watch them play, they haven't necessarily played great football yet. I mean, they're good enough. Um, you know, when you look at all the weapons, when you look at Patrick Mahomes, they can explode on you at any given moment. But from top to bottom, game in and game out, they haven't necessarily been dominating. Maybe another reason why... Again, I don't want to say we're taking it for granted, but we're not talking about them as much. But bottom line is, when it's all said and done, somebody is going to have to beat this team uh, and play good football to beat this team if, um, if they're going to make a run for a championship. Yep, and the only team to do that in the last calendar year has been John Gruden and the Raiders. We would love to see the Bucs and the Chiefs, at least some people would, in the Super Bowl. But after watching the Bucs on Sunday night, not sure about that. How does Tom Brady... Bounce back, Kurt. How do you make sense of his worst effort in, with three picks and no touchdowns in nine years? We always talk about you know, one snap and clear, that you know, one game and clear. As a quarterback, you can't ever let one play lead into the next play, no matter how good or how bad. And it has to be the same from game to game. And great quarterbacks understand that, that you're going to have games like this where things just don't go your way that what you prepared for during the week doesn't play out uh, on Sunday or Sunday night like last week for Tom Brady I don't question whether he's going to bounce back I don't question oh did, did, did they forget how to play is this what we're going to see the rest of the year this was a bad game by the Bucks, a really good game by the Saints it got away from them very early they were trying to play makeup and trying to play catch up and usually when that happens it just continues to go south. And so Tom Brady wasn't a good game. It wasn't a good game across the board, not just for him, but their entire team. They will bounce back. And this team, I believe, after what we've seen up to this point in the season, this team will be a team you have to reckon with come playoff time. The question becomes, do the Saints have their number? I mean, Saints 2-0 and now, Drew Brees 5-2 and against Tom Brady. And so that will be an interesting shakeout at the end of the year. But the Bucs and Tom Brady are going to be just fine. Yep, the Bucks, by the way, get the Panthers this week, whereas the Dolphins get the Chargers. Kurt, what do you think of Tua now after two starts? This one a little bit better than the first. I like what I'm seeing. Now, he hasn't exploded. They haven't asked him to throw the ball all over the yard, but he's growing with this thing. First game against the Rams, obviously, he didn't have to do a whole lot. Their defense was dominant, but he made some nice plays. He handled the pressure well, got the ball out of his hands, which is something we knew Miami wanted to do and something that Tua was good at. Now against the Cardinals, he had to do a little bit more. He had to answer Kyler Murray in that Arizona offense that was scoring some points. He had to continually answer those questions and some with his arm, some with his legs, not making mistakes. All things that we know about Tua. He's really good at getting the ball out of his hands. He's really accurate and he's a gamer, right? When he shows up and he's got to make a play, we saw in that game he made the plays that he needed to make for them to win. Now, if we continue to see that kind of growth week in and week out, it is going to be fun to see where he finishes this season. But everybody has to be excited, not just in Miami, but around the league with what we've seen from Tua early in his career. Totally different topic here, Kurt. Um, Matthew Stafford had to deal with it last week, and that is being on the COVID list, couldn't be around the team, didn't practice, and showed up on Sunday and played. He obviously got knocked out. He's okay now, thankfully. Ben Roethlisberger is going to have to do that this week for veterans how tough is that well i can't say that i had to go through it andrew so i don't really know how tough that is but we are all creatures of habit we like things certain ways we like to see things on the practice field we like to prepare we like to have 
our meetings a certain way and, and get a feel for what we're going to do on Sundays. Now, veteran guys, they've got their routine. They can prepare. They can get ready. They've made all these throws a million times. So it's not like they can't show up and play. But this is new for everybody. And so you're trying to figure out your routine in the middle of a week. Uh, it's not like you've been preparing for this for nine weeks to go, okay, I got this down. It's in the middle of the season. All these games are big. And now you're having to figure it out and make sure that you stay in the rhythm and, and you're locked in with the things that are going on. Matthew Stafford last week, I heard he was running meetings via Zoom and via, via, via a big screen. And so those things are kind of cool. We've advanced from a technology standpoint, so maybe that helps. Um, but again, creatures of habit, we like to do things the same way. So it is adjustment no matter how young or old you are at the quarterback position. The difference will be for Roethlisberger if he continues to test negative. He would be able, they think with the timing, to be there for the walkthrough on Saturday, something that Stafford was not able to do. Baker Mayfield was back at practice as well today for the Browns, so he has been cleared. Thank you, sir. As always, Kurt Warner, safe travels, our Hall of Fame quarterback with us on NFL Now. Coming up next, time to make some second half of the season projections what the numbers tell us about these teams and how many games they might win. It's a chief and scores. Caught at the right front pylon. Touchdown. He's going to walk on in. Touchdown. The kick is up and it is way right. It's no good. Gilbert drifting to his right. He's got a man in the end zone. Lamb. Throws for the end zone. Touchdown, Pittsburgh. Juju at the five. To the goal line. Touchdown. That's Eric Ebron into the end zone. And that's your ball game. Carr's going to go for the home run. Touchdown. Caught in the back of the end zone by Waller for a touchdown. Game Neighbors has it. Touchdown, Chargers. Jump ball. Caught. Single is touchdown. The ruling on the field has been changed. It's incomplete. Game over. That's right to the five. And Kyler Murray has a touchdown. Corner of the end zone. Touchdown. The kick is good gonzalez short two is gonna try to do it himself and i think he's got enough what a win for tua and the dolphins they improved to five and three on the year you know i always have to warn people when i say if the playoffs started today i know they do not okay but this is what the current nfc picture looks like with new orleans number one after beating the buccaneers again the AFC looks like this. The Steelers as the only undefeated team remaining, clearly the one seed. Right now, it's three wild cards with Baltimore and Vegas and Miami. Time now for some game theory and some second half of the season projections here with Cynthia Freeland, who's trying to map out what the playoff picture will look like in January. First of all, Cynthia, how did we come to these projections? So I took every single game that remains for the rest of the season, and I took the win projections. So each game isn't a 50-50 coin flip. Some games is like 70 or 30, right? So you add all of those together, and it comes up with the win totals. And then I applied that to the formula for the playoffs, and here we have it. Okay, here we have it. And right now, and for those who don't know this year, seven teams in each league and only one bye. So right now we have the Steelers as getting that one bye in the AFC. Is that how you see it ending? Uh-oh, Steelers aren't going to like me so much. No, I actually have the Kansas City Chiefs with 13.3 wins. So remember, the fractional win is because not all games have a 50-50 value proposition. But they earn it in 22.2% of the simulations. And there are over a million simulations here. So really, when you look to see the complementary aspect of Patrick Mahomes along with a great Chiefs pass defense, that is what solidifies them as having the number one projected seat. And by the way, they edge out the Steelers by 0.04% for that for one buy. Okay, and the only buy and the only team that gets that first week off. What about the final spot of the AFC? The Miami Dolphins. That's kind of a surprise compared to the beginning of the season. But in my models, I have 9.1 wins projected for them. Part of that is their schedule. They have a favorable schedule going forward. They get the number seven seed also because their defense has been surprisingly good and has allowed Tua to have the space to grow and develop. Obviously, there's only been two games, but we saw a significant increase in the second game. And that tr projection proceeds for the rest of the season. Okay, easy for it, me to say. It, yeah, you know, I mean, easy for me to understand, too. We all got it here. So on, on the top of the NFC, 
uh, standings here. We have a log jam at six and two. Right now, the Saints are number one. Do you have them sticking at number one? I don't. The Packers have a more favorable schedule, so they get 11.6 wins that is a significant difference because you want that number one seed for the bye they need to address their run defense that's what they really project for the playoffs to potentially stumble on however with Aaron Rodgers and their run offense Aaron Jones you're seeing on the screen that is what helps solidify their wins for the rest of this regular season all right what about the Rams they're coming off a well-needed buy here right in the middle of the season at five and three did not look good against the Dolphins and now they have the Seahawks and the Bucks, what about their chances? As the number three in their division, they will make the playoffs per my projection. 8.9 games this season. There's still a lot of NFC West left to be played. The division is not sorted out yet. However, I have every team except the Niners making it from this division. Why? Well, obviously, the defense really anchors this and We've seen the potential for that offense, and given their schedule, this is what maps to a lot of potential success, meaning playoff situation for them as the number seven seed. All of these projections and the numbers and the insight at NFL.com slash Freeland, Cynthia Freeland's projections for the playoff picture when we get to 2021 in January, which can't get here soon enough. Thank you. Cynthia. The playoffs don't start today? Oh, they no, don't they don't. Today. No, I love how people get mad at me. They don't start today. Yes, I know that. But you know what I also know? That the Ravens have the number 31 pass offense in the NFL. 31. Really? How does it get better? Charlie Casserly will tell you next. Get Jackson's going to get it, and he's going to get more. All the way. Touchdown, Baltimore. Extra gear. Lamar Jackson out the back door without opposition. Because they had run it so well inside, they bought that fake fully. Lamar Jackson's like, oh, hey, ball's over here, fellas. Look, the Ravens are still 6-2. and two. They're still undefeated on the road. They're still in today as a playoff team if the season were to end, which it is not going to. And these numbers on the right for Lamar Jackson are still pretty good. But uh, things are different. Hi there, Charlie Casserly. The Ravens have the number 31 pass offense in the NFL. What do you see as the difference here between last year and this? Yeah, I tell you, so first of all, teams have had a chance now to study the game, study the option game, their offense, practice. Uh, one team I talked to spent 15 minutes in every practice defending the Ravens, who they were going to play this year. So let's roll the tape. They're defending the option and taking away the run from Lamar Jackson better. Pittsburgh sends 90. What? Right at him. He's got the quarterback. Hey, he's got to hand off the ball. So we're taking him out of the game, and we'll defend everybody else. Now, here's an example. He likes to throw inside the hashes, so people are playing more zone defense and jamming inside there. Pittsburgh gets an interception to take away the tight end inside. So, again, people have read the offense. They're defending it better, defending him better. But you still can't defend this one now, right? He does a good job reading. It gets outside the pocket. Do not not let him outside the pocket. He's dangerous as a runner and passer. He's still the fastest guy on the field. The thing he couldn't do was well last year is throw outside the hashes. People have forced him to do that. All right. And for those wondering, Charlie, who is the number 32 pass offense in the NFL? The only one worse <laughs> statistically than the Ravens would be the Jets. So this week, the Ravens go to New England. It's the Sunday night game. They get to face Cam Newton. Lamar today said he's, you know, he's looked up to Cam. Cam is Superman. He's the GOAT. He's the OG. Um, how is Cam, or how can Cam, Charlie, have some success against that Wink Martindale blitzing defense? Well, I'll tell you, it's going to be tough. You know, both quarterbacks, the game plan, when you talk to defensive coordinators, keep them in the pocket, make them beat you from there as a drop back quarterback. Now, let's roll the tape. Uh, Cam's at a little bit of a disadvantage. We know he came in late, but he's got big, strong-arm guy. The deep ball and the deep out, those are things that 
or trying to strengths of his game. He doesn't have deep receivers here. Now, he, he gets lucky here because somebody gets open deep. That doesn't happen often for him. Now, what the big thing to me is he's committed to being a runner again. And New England has done a great job with Josh McDaniels designing runs. So when you go in there, you've got to stop him as a runner, and he has been very effective. Now, accuracy, we know this. He's not a very accurate quarterback compared to other quarterbacks in the league. Here he's got a guy wide open, and he misses him there. The book on him is keep him in the pocket, make him read his progressions. His accuracy won't be great sometimes. Uh, he'll be slow getting rid of the football. But he is a runner, and that's the most dangerous thing about him. They're going to have trouble scoring against Baltimore, believe me. Yeah, here's the crazy stats just handed to me from Garrett from research. So four straight games, Charlie, for Cam Newton without a touchdown passes, or without a touchdown pass, rather. No quarterback has gone five straight in a single season without a touchdown pass since Geno Smith in 2013. So that is what Cam Newton is staring at this week against the Ravens. Should be a good one. Why can't I talk Sunday night? Thank you, Charlie. It's NFL now. I'm going to try to keep talking and learn how to speak for the second hour. Coming up, Carson Wentz, Daniel Jones, as they get together in the NFC East this week. We'll tell you what the Eagles quarterback had to say. It's Veterans Day. And the same from Houston as well with another one of the faces of the National Football League. J.J. Watt, a day to honor and thank all of those who have served to protect our freedom and this great land. I will echo their sentiments as well, and I will open this hour by saying happy Veterans Day to any and everyone who is currently serving and all of those who have served. Thank you for your sacrifice. And that goes to my father, Stephen, as well, who served in the Army as a captain in the 60s and the 70s. My name is Andrew Siciliano, and this is NFL Now. Coming up in this hour... Anthony Munoz, the Hall of Famer, will join us to tell us what uh, Veterans Day means to him. Also, as the Ravens get ready for a trip to New England, we have a report on who Baltimore might get back on the field this week. And we are live in Nashville ahead of a pretty big game on Thursday night football in the AFC South. We begin this hour, however, with news out of Carolina. News that is not necessarily good for Christian McCaffrey. Hello, Ian Rappaport. Hello, Mike Garofolo. Ian is shaking his head already because McCaffrey, after missing six weeks with an ankle injury, and after coming back last week, is already ruled out this week. Yeah, not going to practice this week. Not going to play as I turn my sound down on my computer. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, Christian McCaffrey not going to play. And this goes back, Andrew, to the shoulder injury that he actually had late in last week's game. You could see him hit the turf right there, was grimacing on the sideline, just not in a good place. He actually came back in to the game, played one play, somehow was in considerable pain later that night and then the next morning. He is actually seeking a second opinion right now on that shoulder just to see where he is. And the real question for the Carolina Panthers is not, is McCaffrey going to play this week? He's not. It's, is he going to play again this season and when? Some real mm. concerns here that McCaffrey and the Panthers have to figure out. Who forgets to turn the sound off on their laptop? Oh, wait, I did that no. hour one. So we've both done it. Um, oh, we're doing good. McCaffrey, okay. yes. Uh, the big thing with the Panthers uh, and McCaffrey when he had the high ankle sprain was get him as close to 100% as possible, despite the fact that they were at a, in a position where they were winning games without him, and all of a sudden, surprise, they were in the middle of a potential playoff race here. Now starting to tail off a bit in large part because uh, the schedule is entering the tough portion of the program for them. Um, so I, I would imagine they take a similar approach, regardless of how things look, making sure that McCaffrey's not there at anything less than somewhere around 100% uh, because they're building for the future there in Carolina. That's number one. Number two, um, I know you could look at those games when he was out and say, well, this team did a good job of winning without him. They could do it again. And, and yes, they did. Uh, however, having him on the field uh, certainly makes this team better. Let's not mistake that, despite what Mike Davis has done. And the Panthers' plans to actually use Davis and McCaffrey on the field at the same time, which they did before he got hurt the first time, didn't really get a chance to fully uh, roll that out once again because it looks like it's going to be one and done before McCaffrey's on the shelf for an extended period of time here. Which is why they activated Reggie Bonifant, brought him back from the practice squad, and he is expected to be in uniform there with Mike Davis as they 
host the Buccaneers coming up on Sunday. The Bengals are getting ready for the Steelers, who have their COVID-19 issues. Mike and Ben Roethlisberger, who they hope to get back on Saturday, some other guys. Now the Bengals have some issues of their own. They told the DBs to stay home today. That's right. One of their practice squad players, a cornerback, was uh, uh, tested positive for COVID-19. And so it, for a couple of hours as they ran the contact tracing, they told their DBs, uh, just hang out, stay home, let's figure this out. And at one point it looked like they were all going to be allowed back into the building. And then they said, you know what, just to be safe, abundance of caution, say it with me, even though I already said it. Um, they kept those guys out of the building. So a handful of guys, I was told four more, not in the building, but not high risk close contacts as of right now. Remember, high risk close contact means you land on the COVID-19 list and you're down for at least five days. Not going to be the case here, but one day of practice lost for a handful uh, of Bengals cornerbacks here, or defensive backs, excuse me, at a time where the Steelers, the team that they're playing on Sunday, is without the player, Ben Roethlisberger, that we expect to be throwing the passes into the Bengals secondary. So for at least one day, the playing field sort of leveled here. All right, kind of. Yeah, it seems somewhat fair. And, you know, there's, there's also some other concerns, I think, for the Cincinnati Bengals. But maybe a small glimmer of hope here. Joe Mixon, their star running back, missed the last couple games with a foot sprain. He actually was back practicing today. Didn't participate in team drills, but he did participate in a little bit of individual work. Not a big step, but a small step for Joe Mixon. And, you know, usually if you are very, very, very limited on Wednesday, doesn't bode well for you playing on Sunday. But at least he was out there. That is a step forward. Figure Mixon has a shot to play on Sunday. Okay, that would be a very good thing. Speaking of running backs and injuries, Mike, we have not seen Bryce Love, the former Stanford running back, on a football field since December of 2018. Is he getting closer? Well, we'll see him on a practice field as the Washington football team has activated the 21-day window. Uh, for Love to practice uh, before he's either activated off injured reserve or kept on there for the remainder of the season. And a lot of times you've seen it this year uh, as the three-week injured reserve uh, system has been in place because in part of COVID this year um, that players get activated off of that list or their, excuse me, their practice window gets open and then they are added to the active roster uh, the coming weekend. Not expecting that to be the case for Bryce Love. He's got to prove that he's getting himself back here and he's got a chance to be the player that they thought that he was going to be or had a chance to be a lot of folks before he got injured. Um, it's going to be deep into that window before we hear anything either way, I am told. Um, and still a chance that we may not see him on the field this year or perhaps beyond, Andrew. Yeah, truly rooting for Bryce Love. Heisman caliber running back while at Stanford. The Redskins hope they can eventually get him back on the field. And we certainly hope for Bryce that he could find some of that magic that he had in Palo Alto. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Ian. Let's continue to look at some of the other games coming up this week on NFL Now, like round two between the Eagles and the Giants. Philadelphia has won two games in a row, a winning streak that started with that primetime victory on October 22nd against Joe Judge's team. I'd say in relation to the last game, to us it's really irrelevant, the result of anything that happened last game. Uh, all that matters is we learn from our experiences on the field and that we play a better game and a complete game as a team. But this is a, de a different team. This is an improved team. They got a lot of their guys back off of injury. They're an explosive offense. It's one of the top defenses in the league. And obviously, Dave Fitt does a tremendous job on special teams. So we have a lot of respect for this opponent. Uh, we got to have a good week of preparation. And we got to go make sure we execute on the field on Sunday for 60 minutes. As for the Eagles, they are coming off a much needed buy. And once again, it's back to the quarterback conversation here. Did you hear what Brett Favre said? He said that his former teammate Doug Peterson should have kept Nick Foles and gotten rid of Carson Wentz. No, Carson's our guy. Carson's our draft pick. Carson's the guy that uh, is, is going to carry us and, 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 and lead this football team. And, and listen, Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Those aren't those aren't my words. Those aren't Howie's words, Jeffrey's words. Those are his words. I mean that I respect that opinion. Whatever he wants to say, that that's fine. And we're gonna remain friends. It doesn't doesn't bother me one way or the other. All I know is that Carson Wentz is our guy. And 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 it's my job to to get Carson Wentz to to, to play better, to do better, to help this football team win, as it is to get everybody else to play better. And and so um 
you know, again, I respect his opinion and his words. Those aren't mine. Please don't put words in my mouth or we're going to have a problem. And, and um, Carson's our guy. Bottom line. End of story. <sighs> Hi, Kim Jones. And we're back to this again. And they asked Wentz about it. And he said, hey, had you heard, heard the comments? And he goes, no, I haven't. Enlighten me. Whatever. I mean, we're doing this, I right. guess. Well, and I was on those Zooms, and in fair, first of all, good for Doug Peterson yeah. saying we're all entitled to an opinion. Unfortunately, that, I guess that's necessary to say, which is absolutely ridiculous. Brett Favre can say whatever he wants, and Doug Peterson being a former teammate and friends with Brett Favre is incidental, in my opinion, to this conversation, because they've shown with actions that Carson Wentz is their guy. Now, I will set it up this way as well, Andrew. That was take three of Doug Peterson being asked about Favre's comments because in the first two, he essentially said he's entitled to his opinion and he left it there. And at the last question of his Zoom was from a reporter who essentially said, Doug, like you've started a fire here. Do you want to put it out before it really becomes a blaze? And that's when you got that answer from Doug Peterson. But interesting. Uh, it makes for a headline. It makes for a good story. It gives us a talking point. And it is interesting when he has to answer what his good buddy and former teammate Favre says. But like I said, Carson is their guy. And for his uh, part on Zoom today, Carson Wentz said, yes, he's been sacked more than anyone in the league. He understands that. He's rejuvenated after the bye. And he said that with communication and getting rid of the ball quicker, he can help out his offensive line, which, by the way, is getting healthier. And it sounds like they're going to have Alshon Jeffrey and Miles Sanders against the Giants on Sunday. Yeah, it was. I, it, it stood out to me as well when, when he said, you know, I could get rid of the ball faster. I could make quicker reads. Yeah. I can do my part to not be sacked yeah. as many times as I have been sacked. And it was the last question to Wentz as well about Favre. Yes. Hey, have you heard? He's like, no. <laughs> I haven't. Enlighten me. Whatever. Anyway, uh, we had the VO earlier, TV term, voiceover. And we, we showed Daniel Jones no turnovers last week against Washington. Not what I called them before, against Washington. My apologies. I'll put a dollar in the fine jar. So, yeah, there's something. There's one to grow on for the Giants. Well, it, you know, it's in two of his career games against Washington that Daniel Jones hasn't had a turnover. Uh, so against that team, he's had great success. Against everyone else, it remains a work in progress. You know, in May, um, and I went back to my notes from, from the offseason, in May on Zoom, Daniel Jones told us that it was a fairly easy fix when it came to ball security because it was an issue last year as a rookie. Well, you know, I'm not so sure about that, to be honest with you. And I asked uh, Giants quarterbacks coach Jerry Shaplinski yesterday about that on Zoom, and he said it's not an easy fix. It is their number one priority. They drill it every single day. They find new drills to use with Daniel, and it is absolutely not easy. And as we know, it is essential that Daniel Jones take care of the ball as quarterback of the New York Giants. Listen, they have lost to the Eagles 12 of the last 13 meetings and eight in a row. They don't have a chance if they give them the ball on Sunday. Don't have a chance. They got to clean that up, and they know it. Absolutely. I'm not telling them anything they don't know. I just think it's great that you you have notes from the summer that you can readily access. I mean, I can't even find from anything May. on the passenger the seat spring. of my car. It was the spring. It was May. People should see my from desk May. here. It's a disaster. Thank May. you, Kim Jones, um, who keeps good notes while you're good at your job. Ahead of the Giants and the Eagles round two coming up this week in the NFC East. How about the Titans and the Colts of the AFC? It is man in the NFL. Touchdown for the Colts, Zach Paso. It's picked off by the Colts. Kenny Moore runs it into the end zone for a touchdown. Intercepted, the Butler did it. What a move. Yes, TD for CD. Touchdown, INDY. It's Jonathan Taylor. AJ Brown with play strength to spare. <laughs> I think it is great that we are opening up week 10 with this one. The Tennessee Titans, who had lost two in a row, came home last week and they beat the Bears. This is huge. They are one in the AFC South. The Colts are two in the AFC South, and they're going to play twice now in three weeks. Yeah, no doubt it's a big game. Obviously, 
Uh, division games are, are huge. Uh, being at home, uh, big opportunity on Thursday night. So we're looking forward to this one. Uh, I know we all want this one really bad, as do they. But at the end of the day, it's going to come down to uh, to who can go out and execute and make the plays on Thursday night. And all re due respect to Ryan Tannehill, who's playing lights out football. Hello there, James Palmer in Nashville. A lot of people think this game comes down to can Indianapolis and that number three run defense find a way to contain enough, a little bit, Derrick Henry. This is going to be strength versus strength, Andrew, right? And you look at what Derrick Henry's done in his four games against top five rushing defenses in his career, 48.8 yards per game against that group. Again, just a small sample size, but some teams who have had good defenses have done well against Derrick Henry running the football. Now, it's interesting, Darius Leonard, the star linebacker for the Colts, said this week, it might sound crazy, but I'd rather have Derrick Henry running between the tackles than outside the tackles. He said between the tackles, he's still powerful, just not as powerful outside he can use that stiff arm. He can run around you. He can run over you. He can do a lot of different ways to beat you. Now, what Mike Vrabel says makes this defense so good, and he knows something about playing good defense, is that they are great tacklers, but on top of that, their tacklers move so well. They're so fast across the field, and I think that part in particular is a big aspect of this, Andrew, as nobody has more yards after contact in the NFL running the football than Derrick Henry. The Colts are number three in allowing the fewest yards after contact. So I believe wrapping up and tackling is a big aspect for this Colts defense and slowing down Derrick Henry, which again, this is strength versus strength. It's going to yeah. be a really big aspect to watch in this game. Nobody is ignoring it. And a lot of times on the outside, as well as Josh Norman can attest, you're trying to make solo tackles and that stiff arm is is deadly <laughs> when it's when it's between the tackles obviously it it's it's sometimes a, a a team effort here a lot of run action as well the titans love to use that um darius leonard anthony walker though have been pretty good against that that's also kind of strength for a Andrew, strength i've lost you i'm just gonna throw right myself right into Do talking it. about this play action game because we talked about this beforehand and i knew you're gonna ask me about it so i'll <laughs> talk about the titans play action game and what they do and how the colts are so good at defending it not only do they do they go downfield when they use their play action game? Maybe more than almost anybody in the NFL. The Colts, on the other hand, are so good at their linebacker spot to where that they have such good eye and eye discipline. I mentioned Leonard, and then there's Anthony Walker, and they told me this week that their preparation and how they go about preparing for play action is a big aspect of why they are so good against it. He said, I don't want to give you any of my secrets. I don't want to tell you how we go about it, but how things are given to us, how they're broken down, and how they're categorized when we look at the film, we are very prepared for play action, and that is the other strength that these two teams have against each other. The Colts are one of the best in every Every single statistical category, Andrew, in going against the play action pass, and we know that is the bread and butter off of this run game for this Tennessee Titans team. Such a pro. Can't hear me, but I'll applaud for James Palmer. Tip of the cap to you. Thank you. Might not have monitor either. James Palmer live there in Nashville. I mean, I could have said something bad about him. He wouldn't have even known. But we're not going to do that. Charlie Casserly, can you hear me, sir? I can hear you. That's right. Can you hear me? I, I got you, Charlie. It, good. Small okay. victories here. <laughs> Let's do keys to the game for I, Thursday night I was night yelling. Football. I'll make sure you heard okay. me. I, I know. I mean, often is the case. Uh, give me your Titans keys, please, first. All right, I'll tell you what, we talked about Indy's pass defense being very good. I'm going to give you a couple ways to exploit it. But first of all, you got to block DeForest Buckner a tackle. Justin Houston is a pass rushing defensive end. Let's roll the tape. So if we can protect, here's a couple areas where you can hit. Zone defense, they play a lot of zone defense. And this is a play that consistently has gained some yardage against the zone defense. The safeties are going to drop deep. The linebackers hang. There's an open area in there. You have to be patient against the zone. Don't force it. Take what is there. Now, if you catch him in man coverage, rock Yasim. That's where we're going to go after. He's going to be the left corner here. Now, I don't know if it's instincts or wandering eyes or lack of discipline, but on this play right here, he's going to look inside. The receiver comes in, but the safety's coming down to cover him. He hesitates, and he gets beaten deep. I've seen this guy get sucked in by play action. I would double move him. I'd combo routes like we saw there, and I'd play action. He's the guy I'd go after in man coverage. Now, we're talking about 
defensively. What are we going to do here? We want to win on first down, win the running game, and then get him to third down to pressure Rivers. Here's Costanzo at left tackle. He gets driven right back into the backfield. Taylor has nowhere to go. By the way, Taylor fumbles the ball, so let's go to strip him if he's in the game. So win on first down in the running game. Get him to third down. Now, Mark Lewinsky, right, ta right guard. He's blocking one. Braden Smith, right tackle. He's blocking two. Win wins on quickness, two wins on speed. You beat Lewinsky with quickness inside. You beat Braden Smith with speed outside. Why is that important? Because Rivers, as you saw right there, he's not going to take a sack. That ball's coming out. We can pressure him into making a bad throw. He has that history. We can't let him sit back there. He'll pick us apart. Yeah, he has that history, and he also has the history of trying to tackle Chuck Clark jumping over him last week as well, which I'm, I'm still laughing about. All right, how about keys to the game, Charlie, on the Colt side of things tomorrow? Well, I'll tell you what, the, the, the Titans' defense has struggled where it's the run of the pass. So let me give you two things you can attack on them, so let's roll the tape. Let's talk about running the football first. We want to run the ball at the inside linebackers. They do not shed blocks well. We get a tight end here, and we get an offensive lineman on them. They don't shed one-on-one -on -one blocks, so we have to get to them. We can run the ball inside. I've seen this many times. I've previewed them before. I'm, I'm going after this one again. Run the ball inside the tackles. Get at the inside linebackers. Now, throwing the ball. They brought over Desmond King from the Chargers. Guess what? The Bears read the scouting report. Long speed. He's a good a cornerback in a short area zone. Right now, Anthony Miller, he runs right by him here. So if he's in man coverage, we want to attack him with speed deep. You can also beat him with quick, shifty moves in an area. Now, defensively, it's simple. We've got to stop Derrick Henry. You want to get him turned to the sideline or stop in the hole. Great gap discipline here. One, two, and three. We're all in our gaps. He does try to get outside, and Leonard is right. We don't want this guy to get outside because that's where he makes his big plays. Great gap discipline here. Now let's turn around and let's talk about not great gap discipline here. That the defensive tackle 70, the linebacker 57. Number one, they don't get off their blocks. Number two, they're in the wrong gaps and open up a big hole. So we got to have gap discipline to stop them. We talked about the play action pass. They love to take the deep shot play action. Derrick Henry, he's not having the year he had before. Why? The offensive line isn't as good. LaWand is out. Conklin's over in Cleveland. So you got two backup tackles, in a sense, playing in there. And other than that, they weren't playing as good anyway. So there's your game plan to beat the Tennessee Titans. All right. Derrick Henry, though, still very much a force to be reckoned with. Thank you, Charlie Casserly, with keys to the game. I, I mentioned the Chuck Clark play. I mean, I, I, I kid because I don't care, as somebody once said. This is Chuck Clark running it back and then jumping over Philip Rivers, who will be a guest of one Michael Irvin coming up tomorrow on NFL Game Day kickoff. I want to show you the fumble. I want you to take me through through the play here. I don't even know if I need to see it again, Mike. Wait, Chuck Clark. <laughs> Chuck Clark hurdles and still going. What's going through your mind here? It's going to make it a harder sell for me to to tell you. I mean, I was a really good pre-safety in high school, but lost my, lost my footing and slipped. They're running the other way with it. That's Frank Clark hurdles Phillip Rivers. He had the nerve to jump over me, Mike, and then, I, and then I didn't know what to do. It was not the best display of athleticism at all, but I can tell you 20 years ago I would have made that play.